So, um, we start a new chapter, and this one introduces a notion that we've had before, which is called, called rhetoric. And what is rhetoric? Rhetoric is persuasive use of language. Um, it's a study that's been around just about as long as philosophy. As a matter of fact, if you guys read other um, bits of philosophy than the Credo, which I'm having you read for this class, you'll find out that philosophy and rhetoric are sometimes at odds with each other. Um, are any of you communications majors? Or business, uh, like marketing? Um, I don't think we have any specialized things than that. Those are um, careers in which you'd focus on rhetoric. Also, if you're going to be an a English professor, actually even an English teacher in, in high school, you study what they call retcon. That means rhetoric and composition. And rhetoric is not by itself bad. So you don't have to get rid of rhetoric. But rhetoric can derail critical thinking. And it does that often by appealing to the emotions. It does it also by appealing to arguments that on their surface seem like good arguments, but often aren't. And in this chapter, we're not focusing so much on arguments. We're focusing more on something at an even lower level. How do you approach language? And when you're talking about things, I think all of you know this by now, you can say things in many different ways, right? You can say the same term, you can communicate the same basic information, but you can put what we call a spin on it. Um, and that spin is going to vary according to, to what? What would make you change the wording that you use? Oh, what did you say? The setting you're in or, or the audience. I heard a few people say audience. And rhetoric really focuses on making the words persuasive to a particular audience. Um, now, if you're being targeted with rhetoric, then you should be a little bit wary, right? Because people may be using language <coughs> just to appeal to you, and it may not um, be the best information. And your book talks about a number of different um, techniques, and we're going to look at several today. So the first to, these are closely related terms. Yeah, euphemism. And now we don't use this one quite so much in our, our language, but it's good to know anyway. Deucemism or dysphemism, depending on how you want to pronounce it. These are coming from Greek words. Um, this Prefix, I think you guys can figure out what it, what it means. Think about dysfunction. If you have a dysfunctional family, uh, how would you describe that family? Crazy. Crazy, yeah. What's that? Not functioning. Not uh, functioning. Not functioning, right. So dys means not or poorly. And eu means good or well. And Famism comes from a word that means to speak or to say. So something that's well said is a euphemism. Something that's poorly said is a, a dysphemism. And we don't mean that it's poorly said in the sense that you stammer or you can't come up with a word on the spot or anything like that. We mean that you choose a word that is going to make things look worse than they are. And with a euphemism, you do the opposite. You pick a word that's going to make things sound better. So if I say, um, instead of talking about your, your test, if I say, you have a learning opportunity coming up, what am I doing? I'm using a euphemism, aren't I? Or um, you have an opportunity to serve your school. We're always being given opportunities to, to serve our school. Um, what does that language convey to you? If you start reading between the lines. Whenever somebody gives you an opportunity to serve, how do you take that? 
Yeah. Um, for one thing, opportunity is a little bit of a misnomer because opportunity conveys the idea that, well, you could take it or you couldn't take it. Often it's, you're going to do it. <laughs> and then to serve, um, that sounds a little nice. To do work for, for no pay, uh, that doesn't sound quite so good. That's, that's a more neutral description of the situation. Um, to be enslaved to the university. Okay, that would be a dysphemism, right? Because nobody is actually enslaved to the university. We don't have people toiling in the basement, you know, uh, not getting paid at all. We do have a lot of people who don't get, get paid that well. Um, at this place, not so much the faculty and more the staff. You know, if you actually look at the salaries of people, they're sometimes a little disproportionate. And you can put spin on that one way, and you can put spin on that the other way. Your book gives you a, a few good examples here, like uh, how many of you have cars or, or are thinking about getting a car in the next two years or so? Um, so you should be attuned to this. Pre-owned. What does pre-owned mean? That, that's a euphemism. It is descriptive. It has been owned before. But what, what does that convey? It's sort of a warm way of talking about a car that is used. used and it has somebody else's problems. They got rid of that car either because they actually were the old lady who only drove it on Sundays or because they wanted a better car. And if you're buying that car, you may be buying a set of problems. Um, that's a euphemism. And there's a lot of great examples here about uh, politics, people fighting against the government of the country. Um, like if you th think about the, the revolution that's taking place in the Arab world right now, how do you actually describe the protesters? Do you describe them as Islamic militants? Do you describe them as freedom fighters? Or do you pick something in between, which is much more likely where the truth is? Or think about the uh, labor dispute that's going on in Wisconsin right now. I don't know if any of you have been following that story. It's pretty, pretty big news, and it's still going on. Um, people are saying, this is the one chance that the unions have to actually you know, stake their claim. Um, that may be euphemism or dysphemism, depending on which side you're on. They're starting to use biblical language and talk about this as Armageddon. Um, that's rhetoric right there. Right? This is actually about a bill that is changing a few things in collective bargaining. It's not destroying collective bargaining or taking the unions away forever. Um, it's, it's, you know, altering some of the things for some of the employees. But it's made out to be, through reducemism, as if it's the end of the world. Now, is it good for those government employees? Is it, you know, if we talk about it as just pruning back excess? That's a euphemism, right? We're talking about getting rid of some people's jobs. So, again, the truth, where is it? Somewhere in the middle. So you want to be very careful uh, about... Um, euphemistic and deusphemistic language. Um, like he says, euphemisms and deusphemisms are often used in deceptive ways. Um, you can get paid by other people to come up with nice ways of saying things, ways that make people feel good, or scary, threatening, um, dismaying ways of saying things, things that make people feel bad. Um, some people do this naturally. Right? I think all of you have friends who tend towards putting things in the worst terms possible, or family members, right? And then you have some people, we often call these uh, Pollyannas, or um, maybe some contemporary terms. Um, you know, the people that are always making things sound better than they are. Do we have any words for that these days? Optimist. <laughs> well, yeah, optimist, pessimist. But this goes a little bit further than just being an optimist. Um, okay, so I think you, you have that concept down. And this leads us into another closely related thing. Um, what we call rhetorical definitions and rhetorical explanations. And this is a little bit higher order, right? 
So with euphemisms and deucephemisms, you can pick terminology that makes something sound good or sound bad. Um, when you're asked to give a definition of something, you can use euphemisms or deucephemisms to make it sound good or sound bad. <coughs> Rather than talking about it in neutral language, you can define something so that the case that you want to have the, the person take is already taken for granted. So there's certain ways of defining things that you'll, you'll put a spin on it. Likewise with explanations. Why is this happening? Well, those dirty liberals are, are at it again. Or those crazy right-wingers are at it again. Um, those are rhetorical explanations. If you're using loaded language like that to explain something, you're not really explaining it. Because when somebody's asking for an explanation, unless they're just looking to be tricked or to, to have you, you know, support their case, they're really looking for you to tell them why something happened or, or how something is taking place. They're not looking for you to give uh, some spin, right? And when you're asking somebody else for an explanation, are you looking to be misled? I hope not. And maybe if you're a masochist, you are, right? Um, so your, your book has a few good examples of this, um, and it brings up abortion. There's an interesting uh, sort of joking example of this with rhetorical definitions. There's a politician who's asked, so what's your stand on abortion? And this is a litmus test, right? This is one that, that politicians sooner or later have to take a stand on. And some politicians are very clearly against abortion, right? Some politicians are very clearly for abortion, you know, some of them actually come out and say it's a positive good or, you know, it should be funded by the state or, or things like that. And one politician reportedly, I think this is probably made up, one politician said, well, if by abortion you mean the uh, sacrifice of millions of unborn children to the whims of irresponsible people every year, and I'm definitely against abortion. Now, if by abortion you mean an elective procedure that every woman has a right to have if she so chooses, and which is protected by, you know, U.S. law, well, then I'm for it. Yeah, now there's the problem. Um, neither one of those is, is an adequate definition of what's going on, is it? They pick out one side of the issue. Uh, and a lot, some of you exhibited sort of shock at somebody being able to take, they take that position on both sides, right? But, why can they do that? Well, rhetorical definitions don't capture what something adequately is. Don't adequately capture what something is. Um, if you had to define abortion, probably a better way of doing it would be talking about um, the destruction of an unborn, uh, and again, do you choose the word fetus or do you choose the word child? Um, it may be difficult to come up with a definition in this case that doesn't already have some commitments to it. Because if you say child, what's the, the conclusion you have to draw? It, it's, it's murder, right? If you say fetus, well, that doesn't sound quite so, so bad. But then, you know, the, the opponents of abortion say, well, you're kind of candy coating things, aren't you? Because... Uh, what kind of fetus is it? Dog fetus? Snake fetus? Right. So, I mean, there's, this is one of those areas where you may not be able to find a non-rhetorical definition. And in that case, you want to find something that's closer. Um, and we have really any controversial issue you can think of, ranging from global warming, or now, you know, global climate change, since they... That's a good example. They had to change the name, right? From global warming to global climate change. Why, why did they have to do that? Any of you remember? About five years ago, it was always global warming. Yeah, because like yeah, actually, in some, in some cases, it's cooler. And, um, well, you, know, you can't call it global warming if, in fact, it's resulting in, in more <laughs> snow and, and more uh, cold temperatures. Um, so you call it global climate change. Is that a um, euphemism, deucephemism, um, or is there, is there some sort of slant going on there? Uh, maybe. I mean, that's something to think about. Um, 
really any controversial issue that you can pick, it's possible to produce rhetorical definitions for it. Um, likewise, rhetorical explanations. This is a, a, even more complicated, right? When you're given an explanation, <coughs> you have <coughs> excuse me, you have not just a single claim, something is this, you have a whole set of claims. Well, this happened because of this, and because of this, and this led to this, or if you want this to take place, then you have to do this, this, and this. So if we say, um, take something like, um, why is there a revolution taking place in the Arab world right now? Why are, you know, millions of people um, against their governments? And some of them, you know, up in arms when our government's cracking down on protesters. You have the opportunity to give a lot of rhetorical explanations. Because um, those people are, are ignorant and uh, can't be trusted with democracy and um, have to be ruled with an iron hand. I think that's probably a rhetorical explanation. Right? But there are people out there giving that explanation. Uh, because the, those people uh, are animated by the inner spirit of freedom to rise up against oppression worldwide. Um, that, that's a rhetorical explanation too, because actually if you talk to a lot of the protesters, um, they're less interested in you know, freedom per se, and they're much more interested in why does food cost so much? Or why did they take my uncle away in the middle of the night and, and kill him? You know, or why can't we assemble? Um, so again, you've got to be very careful when people are providing you explanations of things. Um, yeah, I wonder, if that's, I guess that's the guy next door. Fire on a no, I'm not, I'm not using the, the computer today. Um, so everybody clear about how you can use rhetoric in euphemism, euphemism, rhetorical explanation, rhetorical <coughs> definition. There's actually something that's kind of funny that I thought you'd get a kick out of that ties in with this a little bit. Um, and I'll let you try to figure out where exactly it fits in. It's often called a rhetorical conjugation, or another word that you'll see is emotional conjugation. And sometimes it's actually named after a particular philosopher, Bertrand Russell, who didn't make these up, but popularized these by talking about them on the radio. Now, in the old days, when we used to teach grammar in school, which they don't do very much anymore. You have what was called conjugation of verbs. And if you take a foreign language, you have to do conjugation, right? And so you have first person, second person, third person. And what's the first person? I, you, and then he, she, or it. I'm just going to put he, right? So it's kind of a joke having to do with irregular verbs. In English, we have some verbs that are a little bit screwy like is. Or, or to be, right? I am, you are, he or she or it is. So, for example, I am um, strong in principles. You are he is a an obstinate ass. Three we, three ways of saying the same thing, right? One of them is a euphemism. The other one's a what? Dysphemism, right? And the other one is much more neutral. Um, you can do this with pretty much any euphemism and euphemism you like. So, what's what's a quality you might might attribute to somebody? Anything. What's that? You do it all day long. Anytime you say something about somebody. Idiot. 
Oh, no, that's probably going to be induced just from this one. Okay, so I am not so bright. <laughs> and we want to get to idiot. Um, or let's use a, we'll make it even stronger. Idiotic moron. Um, now we need something that's not quite so bad for the U. Um, you are stupid. <laughs> right? Uh, now, again, already the word stupid has some emotional resonance, but there could be some people that are genuinely stupid. And when we say that somebody's stupid, we're saying something different than they're ignorant. You know, ignorant people are just lacking information. Stupid people, general, you know, are genuinely not smart. They, they uh, draw the wrong conclusions. They make dumb decisions. So I'm not so bright. That sounds good, you know. Um, or I could say I'm, I'm challenged, but you know, working against it or something like that. You're stupid, and he's a idiotic moron. Again, rhetorical force. These are three ways of referring to the same thing, but putting very different spin on them, aren't they? So that's something worth keeping in mind. Uh, your book also talks about another thing that we have talked about quite a bit already. Uh, and now it finally treats it thematically. And that's uh, stereotypes, right? And we've talked about this before. What's, what's going on when you're stereotyping? Um, what are the elements of that? Do you stereotype about just a single? It's a group. Usually a group. You're, you're talking about a group. And you're saying that the group has some sort of quality. Usually it's going to be bad, right? Although there could be good stereotypes. I think I told you the uh, story of Charles Wong. Didn't I? Did I tell you guys that one? No. I had a friend named Charles Wine, and this was back in um, college, back in the early 90s. And um, he was a little guy about, about this tall, and he was Chinese. He was from mainland China, and he'd um, been in the Chinese Navy, so he was actually kind of tough, um, but he didn't actually know any martial arts. Now back then, I don't think a lot of people would make this mistake at this point, but back then, a lot of people assumed that if you were Asian, you knew martial arts. Mm -hmm. This guy was a hothead too, so he would get, in, he'd get into arguments at bars with, with you know, whole bunches of guys and he'd start using foul language and calling them all sorts of things in both Chinese and English. And of course what happens then, then they want to beat you up, right? This is, this is the way things work at bars. And what would he do? He'd get into a fighting stance, and then everyone would leave him alone. <laughs> and why? Because uh, they had a stereotype in their mind. They thought, well, he belongs to this group, so therefore he must have this, this quality, being you know, a martial artist or something like that. They'd seen too many kung fu movies or karate movies or something like that. Um, so sometimes the stereotype could be good. You know, the, the stereotype, there's another one of Asians too. Um, Asians are all super smart. Um, you can find some, some not so bright Asians out there. Um, a lot of that has to do with, with uh, traditional culture, it turns out, and the, the ideal of education. Um, interestingly, put, them, uh, put anybody in America for long enough and they start to resemble the rest of Americans. Right? The work ethic tends to go down a bit. Um, the performance tends to go down a bit. Uh, even the diet changes things. It's, here's, here's something kind of interesting. Um, there is this perception of Japanese that Japanese did not have the same sort of physical problems that Westerners did. Um, like acne, for example. And that was true so long as the Japanese diet remained more or less the same. Once they had a more Western diet, which consisted in a lot more meat and a lot more dairy, acne went up. Sizes of children also went up. That's why you can find a lot more um, uh, younger people who are closer in size to sort of Western standards throughout Asia, throughout the, the rest of the world. 
because as dietary um, things go up, you know, as you get better nutrition, more meat, um, you, you, you end up bigger, right? Um, a lot of those things are stereotypes. They're often based on what? Insufficient information about a group. And we talked about how this happens. You meet two or three people from a group and now you think you know all about that group. Um, those could be un unrepresentative members of the group though, couldn't they? Or, or the group could just be a lot more diverse. I mean, if you have to generalize about Americans, America's a pretty diverse society, isn't it? Um, how do we usually <coughs> form teams to represent America these days? We pick people, right? And we pick them, we want it to be sort of a you know, representative example of America, so how do we select them? A little bit of everybody. What's that? A little bit of everybody. A little bit of everybody, yeah. We should have the right proportions. Um, so, you know, whatever team we have should be at least half women, right? And we should, you know, have somebody from each race. Mm -hmm. And we define race in really weird ways. The way we, we define race is not the way that everybody else defines race. They don't draw the same lines as, as, as we do. Um, in part because our, our understanding of race is uh, a little bit skew, you know, skewed. Think about Asian. Is, is Asian really a race? Mm -hmm. It's a racial category. Um, so imagine now if you're stereotyping about Asians. Um, are Indians and Chinese more similar to each other than they are to Westerners? Yeah. No. Two totally different cultures. They don't, and they don't look like, like each other either. Um, you know, uh, South Asians and East Asians, two very different um, groups racially, you know, in terms of genetics and all that sort of stuff. Um, even within, um, uh, what we call racial groups, you know, not all Chinese look alike. As a matter of fact, if you spend a lot of time with Chinese people, you'll find that they don't really resemble each other very much at all, any more than most Westerners do. Um, if you actually spend a lot of time with people, then you start becoming attuned to all the differences between them. If you don't spend a lot of time with them, then they really do all look alike. As a matter of fact, when Western, um, I mean, they can tell the difference between light skin and dark skin, right? But when um, Westerners go to China, in most parts of China, we, we literally do all look alike. We're all big nose people, you know, compared to the Chinese. Actually, that's that's the, the slur word for Westerner. Da beats it. It's it's kind of a way of putting somebody down. Big nose. Um, if you actually spend time with people, then you're less likely to stereotype because you realize that they are in fact diverse, even within the same group. Um, you can you can do this with any group that you pick. You can do this with religions. You know. If you know a few Muslims, suddenly you know everything about Islam. Well, you know, sit down and talk with about a hundred or, or a thousand Muslims and you'll, you'll find out that there's a lot of different ways of living out a Muslim life and, and there are differences in, in their views on how should they do this, how should they do this. Some things are very pre prescribed, you know, you should pray a certain way five times a day. But actually there's four different legal schools just within the Sunni um, Islam, which is the majority. And um, they prescribe different motions for, for prayer. So you've got to be very careful in, in, in stereotyping. And like it says, where do our stereotypes come from? We've talked about this before. Sometimes they come from experiences. And sometimes they just come from, well, somebody said this and I believe it. Right? <laughs> and some of this can come through our, our uh, media. Remember we talked about Bugs Bunny cartoons? Um, because so, do any of you remember the old Bugs Bunny cartoons? Have any of you seen them? They're pretty racist. Have you ever you ever watched their depiction of Chinese people or black people or Mexicans? When you get a chance, go on to YouTube 
and, and just type in Bugs Bunny racist and you will see Bugs Bunny doing all these very stereotypical imitations of people, right? Um, and why was it okay back then? Well, because, you know, that was part of the society. These, these stereotypes were seen as just, well, everybody knows this about Mexicans, or everybody knows this about, about Chinese. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is innuendo. And this is really interesting. You guys all know this term, right? Innuendo? I think you've heard it before. Uh, what, is it, what is it when somebody uses innuendo? What do you understand by that? Go ahead. No, no, I, I would like to hear. You've all heard it used. It's like you're insinuating something that's not being directly said. Yeah. You're saying something without committing yourself to it. It's a way of maybe putting somebody down or implying something without having to take responsibility for it. So your, your, um, your book has this great example. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proof that there's at least one candidate in this race who does not have a drinking problem. Okay, now if a politician says that, they're very clearly saying something about their opponent, aren't they? Yeah. What are they implying? They're an alcoholic. Yeah. Or, you know, I am, I, am, I am proof there's at least one candidate in this race. Maybe there's three candidates. They're all alcoholics, except for me. Um, you can say this about a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm going to give you another example of some innuendo. which I myself actually use. Um, have you ever heard the expression damning with faint praise? It comes from Shakespeare. And it made its way into our language. If you're damning somebody with faint praise, what you're doing is you're, you are saying something good about them, but you're saying it in kind of you know, very non-committal um, way that's actually implying that they're no good. So, if this is why I don't write letters of recommendation for, for students that don't earn A's or B's, right? Because what would I have to say about them? Um, well, they passed my class. Well, if you say that, they passed my class, but you didn't say that they got an A, what is that actually saying? Well, they didn't really work, you know as hard as they could have been in my class, and um, this is what I know about them. So if somebody's asking for a letter, usually I say, well, this is what I'd have to say about you. Know, about you. Do you really want the letter? And usually the students say, no, no, I want something saying that I'm the, the best person in the world, the most qualified for the job. And some students I can say that of, right? Um, if you ask me, we've talked about this before, if you ask me about colleagues who I don't hold in high esteem, will I criticize them? No, I'll, I'll say things like, they're a very nice person. What am I implying there? What's, what's built into the situation? You ask me about, is this professor good? Do they know their stuff? Well, they're a very nice person. They don't know their stuff. They don't know their stuff. Right, something is being implied in the situation. Um, Employers usually don't want to bless you, unless you, you, you've been really good. They don't want to say much when you use them as references, in part because they're afraid of getting sued if you don't get the job. So if you really screw up at a job, and then you, know, you put them down as a reference, uh, they'll get called, and then what they'll say is, well, all we can tell you is that they worked here from this point to this point. If that's all they have to say, again, what's being implied? You don't want this person working for you, you know. Um, they worked for us for too long. <laughs> that was, you know, they were long enough for them to make a bad impression. Um, you can use innuendo in, in a lot of ways to um, convey things. And um, here's another good one. I didn't say the meat was tough. I said I didn't see the horse that's usually outside. <laughs> what is that telling you? What's that? That it's nasty, right. Well, horse meat, 
right? We don't actually eat horse meat in our culture. Uh, they do actually in France in some places. It's kind of a delicacy. And then some, some uh, less developed countries also eat horse meat. Um, for us, if you say that meat is horse meat, you're actually saying it's bad, it's nasty, it's, it's tough. Um, do they sell it on the menu in France as horse meat? Uh, in the places where it's eaten, yes. Yeah. But I don't think that, that's not most, that's not most places. Um, and it does actually give you a few examples of, con of condemning a faint praise. Um, and they use this word, uh, so far, or surprisingly, or I suppose. If you say, uh, so-and-so has done good work for us, I suppose. You're insinuating something, right? Maybe they didn't do good work for you. You're not quite sure. So all of these are ways of slanting language. Notice, none of these are actually using an argument. Yeah, these can all be parts of arguments. And why is this important? Well, when you're making arguments about controversial topics, or when somebody's making arguments to you about controversial topics, they may use language in such a way as to try to change your feelings about things. Um, if you find out that somebody is a socialist labor union organizer, or you find out that somebody is a defender of workers' rights, those convey two very different impressions, don't they? Especially down here in the South, where people hate socialists, apparently. Uh, it's part of the, the culture. Um, so if somebody is using language like this in arguments, you want to be careful. You want to sort of take, take a step back and say, is there a better way to describe this, rather than just immediately tying into it? And you know when it's going to be most tempting to do this? When will, when will this be the, the greatest danger for you? What's that? Elections? Uh, maybe. I was thinking more when it's really working well. When you find yourself agreeing with it, and you start saying, yeah, they're dead on. Watch out. <laughs> 